take the Northern Ireland Troubles. Let's concede that they were, at their heart, religious troubles. Um, having been to Belfast, I keep meeting people who tell me they weren't actually religious troubles. But let's concede that it is. It is widely accepted that the troubles caused the deaths of about 3,500 people over a 30-year period. Again, one death in the name of Christ is a blasphemy. But the iconic status of these two evils of Christendom, the Inquisitions and Northern Ireland, far exceeds the reality. Yet, listen to Peter Watson, the author of Ideas, A History of Thought and Invention. He was, in the New York Times, asked the question, what's humanity's worst invention? He replied, without question, ethical monotheism. This has been responsible for most of the wars and bigotry in history. To which David Bentley Hart in Atheist Delusions replies in characteristic style, the pagan rhetorician Libanius justly bragged that the gods of the Roman Empire had directed the waging of innumerable wars. By contrast, the number of wars that one could plausibly say have actually been fought on behalf of anything we might call ethical monotheism is so vanishingly small that such wars certainly qualify as exceptions to the historical rule. Bigotry and religious persecution, moreover, are anything but peculiar to monotheistic culture as anyone with a respectable grasp of human culture and history should know. And yet, absurd as it is, Watson's is the sort of remark that sets many heads sagely nodding in recognition of what seems an undeniable truth. Such sentiments have become so much a part of the conventional grammar of enlightened scepticism that they are scarcely ever subjected to serious scrutiny. We must concede that there are real horrors done in the name of Christ, but on the other hand, we must also point out that there are gross exaggerations in the retelling of this story that shores up the current paradigm. Thirdly, it is naive and dogmatic for our critics not to admit the great good done in Christ's name throughout history. It is one of the seriously frustrating things of reading um, Christopher Hitchens. God is not great. He concedes nothing of the good done in the name of Christ. This relentless story after story of the evils of Christendom. I always think you should be suspicious of an argument that can't generously concede. We should therefore feel no embarrassment about saying something of the glorious good the church has brought into the world. Let's start with the ancient church. A fact. The first international aid project in world history was Paul's decade-long collection for the famine-ravaged people in Palestine. The early church inherited the Jewish welfare model but instantly said it was open to believer and unbeliever alike. This was a novelty in antiquity. In the year 250, the church in Rome was daily supporting 1,500 destitute people on a huge food roster. By the 4th century, the pagan emperor Julian became so worried that the Christians were going to take over the world by the stealth of good deeds that he started writing to the pagan priests around the empire to say, quick, beat the Christians at their own game. And here's his letter to a priest. For when it came about that the poor were neglected and overlooked by the pagan priests, then I think those impious Galileans observed this fact and devoted themselves to philanthropy. The Galileans also begin with their so-called love feast, open meals, or hospitality or service of tables, for they have many ways of carrying it out, and hence they call it by many names, and as a result they have led very many into this atheism. Christianity was called atheism because it denied the Greek gods. And what about this? It is disgraceful that the impious Galileans support not only their own poor, but ours as well. All men can see that our people lack aid from us. Moving to the modern period. Friends, we need to burn up on our history of the end of slavery in the British realm. 
or uh, Lord Shaftesbury's efforts on behalf of the marginalised and the poor, or of course your um, history of Martin Luther King on behalf of the civil rights movement, or the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, led by Desmond Tutu, all profoundly Christian movements. And even today, most non-government aid in the Western world is serviced through Christian agencies. This is true even in pagan Australia. Here's a quotation from a government report on research and philanthropy in Australia from 2004 by the Department of Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Basically, the whole report found stunningly a huge correlation between religious activity and philanthropy and volunteering. I'm sure it's the case in the US, but you need to find your own figures. I tried to do some digging, but I wasn't sure that I had reliable enough figures to to bring it to you. But you should be doing this. You need to have these up your sleeve. This, friends, doesn't make Christians better than secularists. That's not what I'm saying, and don't please ever sound like you're saying that. But it does belie the claim that we are worse. And that is certainly what is being claimed at the moment. That we are worse. That we poison everything. That we are root of all evil. Fourthly, the elephant in the atheist's room, of course, is that there have only been three, maybe four, formerly atheistic regimes in world history. Stalin, Mao and Pol Pot. And let's be frank, they weren't improvements. Stalin's openly and ideologically atheistic project killed 20 million people. That's more people each week than the Spanish Inquisition did in its 350 year history. The figures for Mao aren't reliably known, I'm afraid. I've seen estimates as low as 10 and as high as 50 million. In his 1999 book, um, Humanity, A Moral History of the 20th Century, British philosopher and ethicist, non-Christian, Jonathan Glover, puts the figure at 30 million and reports Mao as having said, we have so many people, we can afford to lose a few. What difference does it make? For Pol Pot, we do know he killed around 2 million people out of a total population of 8 million people. Jonathan Glover concludes with these words, the shared central project of the three regimes, he's talking about atheistic regimes at this point, was the total redesign of society in ways unrestrained by human feelings or morality. Without these, people who did not fit the plan could be redesigned or eliminated. Now, I know that atheists try to wriggle out of this one by saying that whereas Christian atrocities were done in the name of Christ, atheist atrocities had nothing to do with atheism. I was going to give you a marvellous quote from David Bentley Hart. Can I also just say that um, you'll find a stack of John Lennox interviews on the CPX website, and one of them is on this very issue And it's brilliant. He should be giving this talk. (laughs) Fifthly, anyone can tell you that when Christians are violent and imperialistic, they are not obeying Jesus but defying him who said, love your enemy, do good to those who hate you. At best, friends, the criticism launched by Hitchens and Dawkins and co. only proves that Christians haven't been Christian enough. Believers confess that daily and seek Christ's help. The solution, therefore, is not less Christianity, but more. 